Uh, tonight, um, we have one of our local scientists um, speaking tonight, and uh, many of you probably already know Jeff Holmquist. Jeff is a research scientist down at the White Mountain uh, Research Station. Uh, Jeff is also a local in our community. Um, I know Jeff from down in Small Meadows. Um, I've heard him speak before. He's really an uh, interesting guy. He's been involved in so many different kinds of projects from marine biology, which is near and dear to my heart, um, to, of course, all the work he's doing in the Sierra, um, doing aquatic ecology. So tonight, he's going to be speaking about the flooding of Hetch Hetchy Valley, which was an iconic event, but what's been happening downstream? So, Jeff, welcome. How's my volume? Yay! Thanks for coming. And Carol, thank you, and, uh, and particularly thank you and Annie and Paul for keeping this wonderful Snarl Seminar Series going. So how about a hand for them? <laughs> so important to our community. Um, well, the flooding of Hetch Hetchy Valley truly was an iconic event, and many of you know much of that story. Um, Truly, a, a sister valley to Yosemite Valley was flooded in a national park. Um, and it literally took an act of Congress for that to occur. Um, it also provided a super high quality, very reliable water supply to millions of people. And it also galvanized a nascent environmental movement in the US. Uh, so I'll talk about those things. But our story doesn't really begin there. It really begins much more at the dam but below the dam, not above the dam, in the flooded Yosemite Valley, or Hetch Hetchy Valley, but below the dam. And it doesn't end at the construction of the reservoir and the flooding of the valley, but our story really begins at that time. And that is a story that has not been told that much. And first, a tip of the hat to Ms. Jutta Schmidt-Gengenbach. Jutta, stand up and wave. There's Jutta. My wife and colleague and partner through this entire study for 11 years now. And a tip of the hat also to Ms. Amy Wicks. Amy, you should stand up and wave too. <laughs> Amy, Amy has sorted countless samples and Marie Pavlovsky might be here, but she has also done an awful lot of work with us. And lots of thanks to the Park Service for funding this work. And um, as you've heard with other talks, just a whole gang of people with UC and volunteers, the Park Service and the city of San Francisco also. Um, I should note at this juncture that this whole downstream effort has involved a huge team of people from the National Park Service in Yosemite. So there's our little bite of that project, but there are other aspects as well. A lot of good work has been done, I think. So. Taking a cue here from Monty Python. You know how in lots of talks there's sort of a road map or a table of contents for the things that are going to be covered? So I thought instead of that we'd do something like the book of the film, the book of the talk. <laughs> and so the first part is sort of a sketch uh, and scene setting of the history of the Hetch Hetchy project. And then we'll do a, a talk about probably the biggest part of the study, which is an above below reference study. And this is sort of the gold standard for sussing out potential problems um, or effects of river regulation uh, in which one would sample above the reservoir, below the reservoir, and in some reference habitat. And incredibly, although this project, the Hetch Hetchy project, has been in operation for almost 100 years now, this hasn't been done. So you'll hear about it tonight. And the third part is a little bit shorter and we'll be expanding out of the stream and into wetlands near the river. So, most of you probably know where Hetch Hetchy is. Not so far away, really. There's Mona Lake, and just on the other side of the big hill is Hetch Hetchy. And Yosemite Valley is to the south. And you can see, even in terms of landform, they are not dissimilar. There's a dam at the west end, close up. 
And one thing that may be surprising to you if you haven't visited there <clears throat> is that the reservoir really isn't that big. It's about eight miles long. Um, and the original valley is about three miles, and there's also about five miles of flooded river. Close up of O'Shaughnessy Dam, and an oblique view about this time of year. So you can see this little tendril of water over here, that's Tuilala Falls, which is beautiful, Wapama Falls, and of course the dam, which is roaring as well, with some discharge. And then I like this photo. This is looking obliquely from downstream to upstream. And this is sort of our world for the talk in here. We'll be looking at the river, uh, which is a big part of our discussion, but also the small wetland. So a lot of this area, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, in the reservoir was a verdant valley with a lot of wetland habitat. That's now underwater. And there's a small wetland down here, and there's not a lot in the mid-elevation range that's wetland habitat. Uh, it's mostly these steep granite canyon walls. So this one is disproportionately important, and we'll come back to that. So how many people have visited Hetch Hetchy before? Oh, that's, that's, that is a record <laughs> in terms of proportion. I think you're at least at 50%. So if you've been there before, you may have noticed a certain similarity. Isn't that remarkable? It is just incredible. So <clears throat> over here, instead of El Cap, you've got Wapama Rock. Instead of Cathedral Rocks, you have Kolana Rock over here. We are missing Half Dome. Um, but there's even, for people who climb, there's even Sunnyside Bench over here, pretty much. So uh, it's a remarkable, remarkably similar landscape. And a view that you may not have had, which is looking back at Kolana Rock from the reservoir. So as we go to access our upstream sites, we travel across the reservoir by boat, which is a real treat. Um, this is actually during the drought, July 2015. And you, of course, remember that year, right? I mean, it was dry. But even so, you can tell that this reservoir is pretty darn full, which is remarkable given that year. But, so that's July 2015. Let's go back in time to February 2015 and look at the reservoir. I mean, it's just a picture of desolation. Isn't that amazing? Um, and just a sea of stranded driftwood down here. So when we would go to access our upstream sites in the inlet stream or river above the reservoir, we actually had to hike through that about 20 minutes just to get to the inlet, which was something like this. And this looks like something out of Tremors, doesn't it? <laughs> Utah looks alarmed. <laughs> and a beautiful Bierstadt painting suffused with light as, as all of his work is. A picture of Hetch Hetchy pre-flooding, pre 1865. Um, and a photograph from 1908. I really like this photograph. There's several things to see. First of all, um, a lot of it is wetland in nature. Um, and gosh, talk about flows. I mean, Tuilala Falls here is just spectacular, really going at that time. Um, but here in 1908, even in 1908, um, a battle royale was in progress between people who wanted to develop the reservoir and people who wanted to preserve it. And this is Michael O'Shaughnessy. He was the chief architect of the Hetch Hetchy project. And you can see him identifying this, not as a Tuolumne watershed, but as San Francisco's water supply. Um, he has a bit of the evil genius look to him. <laughs> but, but by all accounts, he was a, a highly respected engineer, and although the project actually lost 65 people, 60, actually 66 people were killed on that project, and despite that, his workers were fiercely loyal to him, and he really did create quite the, uh, quite the project. Quite, quite remarkable. Um, he had an opponent, and uh, this is John Muir leading a field trip in the Hetch Hetchy watershed. I mean, imagine being in the field on a trip being taught by Mr. Muir. That's what's happening. And of course, he was fighting this tooth and nail, as, as many of you know. By 1910, things were looking pretty good for the city of San Francisco. You can see a, a baby, 2010, early in the year. Um, there's development of streetcar way, and you can see the bucket of Hetch Hetchy water heading towards the city, um, there are major efforts in Congress to pass a law that would allow 
development of, um, of the Hetch Hetchy watershed. It hadn't happened yet, but it was looking good. And then by 2013, it did happen, and the Raker Act was passed. Um, this legislation had been held at bay in various ways by the Teddy Roosevelt and Taft administrations, but Woodrow Wilson did end up signing it into law in 2013. I really like this. This is a hand-tinted photograph uh, from 1921. The dam is closing in on being constructed. I like this postcard too. 1923, it is an operation and uh, the artist here really captures the colors and just the nature of the upland habitat and also the river running strongly too. It's a really nice image. And it is a remarkable project, 160 miles in length, all gravity fed. Uh, I think 260 miles of, of pipeline um, and it serves uh, millions of people, 29 municipalities. So it was an accomplishment. It has been controversial, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, in 1987, there was graffitiing of the dam face, and this is actually, as you can tell, a reconstruction of the original um, spray painting or however they painted this um, on rappel on the dam, 1987. And this was fascinating in 1987 as well. This is Don Hodel and Diane Feinstein. Diane Feinstein at that time was mayor of San Francisco. Hodel had been the Undersecretary of the Interior under James Watt in the Reagan administration. Um, and there was another person in between, and then he became Secretary of the Interior. And he and the administration proposed removing the dam and restoring Hetch Hetchy Valley. This is a very interesting turn of events. Um, the city was opposed to this, as you may remember or might imagine, um, and Diane Feinstein referred to Hetch Hetchy as San Francisco's birthright. In contrast, this member of the Reagan administration was proposing removing the dam, and there, was, uh, there were probably several reasons for this. And so it's an incongruous situation, right? So um, one was, it was a chance probably to embarrass a liberal California um, with conflicted interests here. Um, we want our water supply, but you know, we really don't want to oppose a very green project. So there was that. Um, in addition, this was when there was a lot of talk of developing ANWR for oil and gas, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And it is likely that the Hetch Hetchy component of this was being used as a bargaining chip. And the third, perhaps most interesting part, was that it was probably sincere also. Uh, there's, there's a number of lines of evidence to that effect, and Don Hodel, who's still alive to this day, still favors restoration. So, interesting time. And a uh, pre-construction or reconstruction, as you might like, um, by Laura Cunningham. And a PowerPoint mock-up, which I like too. And I'm not sure about this foreground. It kind of looks like Lyle Canyon to me, actually. But yeah, interesting. Okay. Let's talk about below the reservoir. And so the key question here is, what are conditions like downstream of the dam? And to know that, we need to compare with other habitats. So most work on, on dams, it seems, deals with upstream effects. And we're often worried about migra migration, migratory fauna being disrupted as they try to get from downstream to upstream. There's this big hunk of concrete in between. Um, and we've done work like that too in Puerto Rico, just a couple of slides because they're fun and I enjoyed that work. Um, in Puerto Rico, we didn't have big salmon migrating. We had a lot of small fish species like this little freshwater goby and about 12 or 15 species of river shrimp that could get almost as big as a spiny lobster and they would migrate upstream. Anyway, we did all kinds of work on this and uh, that is one of my graduate students belaying me <laughs> on the face of the dam, which, which which may not ever be a smart thing, but it's definitely not a smart thing when they're on the fourth draft of their dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working downstream instead of upstream, and we've used all sorts of sampling techniques to try to get a handle on river condition and relative to other areas, and we'll talk about some of these tonight. So, um, we sampled riffles, and uh, riffles are habitat like this, where you see disturbed water, and it's disturbed because there are rocks underneath that are making the water all topsy-turvy. So we sampled riffles above and below the reservoir, and also on the Merced River for reference habitat. 
And we did that through the year. This is a photograph from standing out in the stream, and yes, it is cold. <laughs> um, and many projects do not sample during the winter. I mean, it's logistically difficult, you, you can imagine. It wasn't too hard on this one, and it's good to do because nature doesn't stop when it gets inconvenient to be out there, and it turns out to actually be critical for some of our conclusions. So we sampled through the year, um, not just during the summer. So there is Utah and Ms. Annie Barrett Kashner out helping us for the day. And that's upstream of the dam. And uh, there is no trail, so we, we hike in the river. And uh, we use nets to sample invertebrates, which are a key part of the story. Uh, we also collect a lot of physical data of various sorts. That's Utah getting some data. And Utah and Amy hard at work in the lab down at White Mountain Research Center. So a picture, this is um, Utah looking upstream at her immediate future, <laughs> because we're gonna hike up there. That's above the reservoir on the Tuolumne River. And this is the Tuolumne below the reservoir, below the dam. And the Merced, um, more or less in the Happy Isles area. So let me show you some pictures. Um, this is habitat in the winter, and the season is an important part of this. So this is just a snapshot of above reservoir habitat. That's below the reservoir. And that's the reference habitat on the Merced. So can you see any differences there? What jumps out? Say what? The rocks? What? A, oh, yes, yes, algae indeed. Um, absolutely algae. So for bonus credit, what else do you see? No fish. No fish, right. Water flow um, actually isn't too different. Um, but I think I heard somebody say rocks, and the substrate sizes are different. If you look at that below habitat, the rocks are bigger. And that's not just an accident. And which water looks warmer? Just kidding. <laughs> That's important too, we'll get there. Okay, so we don't need graphs, although I'm gonna show you some. This is algal growth in the winter. These are our samples that we've taken. And you can see above, below, and reference habitat. And which one has more algae? That's pretty apparent. And that recapitulates what you observed just in the, in the habitat photo. But look in the summer though, things start to narrow. Um, and if we had sampled only in the summer, we would have had a different picture. And then in the fall, there's a lot of algae above and below the reservoir. So algae affects invertebrates. Um, it provides good habitat for midges. So most of you know, I think you all know midges, even if you don't know you know midges. Midges are the little things, you've been out walking around in riparian areas, and there's little things buzzing around you, and they're not as big as mosquitoes, and they don't bite but they kind of get in your eyes and stuff. Those are midges, and they're incredibly diverse and abundant and, and important. Um, so in reasonable numbers, they're a good thing to have. And they like the algae. Mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies don't like too much algae. They need a tiny bit, but they don't need a lot. Um, and you see those letters EPT, we're gonna come back to that. And it's, a, it's a, a way of categorizing these animals. So mayflies are the order ephemeroptera, stoneflies are plecoptera, and caddisflies are trichoptera. And it's a lot easier to say EPT as an abbreviation. So it's bad habitat for those EPT taxa that are bigger, more trophically diverse, and are more important as fish food, and ultimately as um, food for vertebrates as well. Um, Terrestrial vertebrates. So yeah, there's, there's some downstream habitat. <laughs> now, when, when, you, when you have a talk based on invertebrates and algae, you need to sneak your charismatic megafauna in whenever you can. <laughs> so we have yet to collect any cheetahs in the Tuolumne River Basin. Um, but the reason I'm showing you that is that these are predators that need elbow room. They need room to move room around and hunt and find their prey, and they live well in that habitat. This would not make them happy, right? right? Similarly, a lot of our EPT are not happy in that algae because it takes up too much substrate space. It makes things too crowded. They can't move around, um, and it has a number of other effects as well. So why is there so much algae below the dam? That becomes a big question. 
And we've talked a bit about that already. So there, there are three main factors that are non-mutually exclusive that are probably important. Um, the first has to do with substrate particle size. It's basically the size of the rocks and gravel and sand in the river. So on the left, the y-axis is percent cover of the various flavors of rock. And on the bottom, on the y -ax on the x-axis, as you go from left to right, you can see increasing particle sizes. And that's a big range, of course, from silt all the way on up to boulders. So one thing that jumps out immediately is that those are almost cookie cutter images. I mean, they're remarkably similar. So let's look below the dam. That's the above habitat and the reference habitat. And that's below. And you folks identified that already. We saw that there are bigger rocks below the dam, greater proportion of large rocks. That's probably for, because of two reasons. One is that during construction of dams, uh, there's a lot of winnowing of fine sediments as they're major dumps of water early on in the project. That's one thing. The other thing is that in a river, if you think about it, the fines are always being scoured away downstream, but they're being replaced by new fines from upstream. So where are those fines going to come from below a dam? Those fines are in the reservoir. So there's a blockage there, so they can't get there. And then this may have an effect <clears throat> on the algae because number one, there's no scour um, or there's less scour because think of those fine particles of silt and sand and gravel as sandblasting algae when it's carried against it by the, the current. Um, so that doesn't happen. <clears throat> and also there's the whole thing about a rolling stone gathering no moss. Conversely, if you have boulders, non-rolling stones do gather moss, AKA algae. So. Um, those things are probably at play, and we talked about that. Okay, and I was kidding you folks about being able to see the difference in temperature, but, but temperature is important. So here we have a trace. Um, on the y-axis, we've got temperature, just time across here. On the x-axis, the blue is above the dam, the orange is below the dam. That's a big temperature range. Here, I'm holding out on the below image, so you can't see that yet. So you gotta build up the anticipation, right? <laughs> um, but that's a big temperature range from darn close to zero up to what, about 22 degrees C, so about 32-ish you know, to 72-ish degrees Fahrenheit. That's a big temperature range. And the key thing is that right in here, below about five degrees C, algae dies. So even though it builds up during these warm temperatures during the summer, like you saw, it dies off in the winter, and essentially the system hits reset. Control, alt, delete. Reset, the algae's gone, and there's a fresh start. Now, below the dam, it's a different story. Way different. So here, instead of a zero to 22 degree C range, we have about a seven to 14 degree C range. And it doesn't drop below about five degrees C, that algae doesn't ever die back. And it's probably because, as you might imagine, the reservoir is a huge thermal reservoir, right? The big thermal mass. And so it's very hard trying to change the temperature in that reservoir is like steering a battleship. It does change, as you can see. Um, my pointer's still there? Oh, there it is. Uh, it does change, but very slowly, a little bit late in a very damped fashion. So this temperature is probably driving algae as well. Now, hard to do anything about the substrate size. Um, almost impossible. Uh, very difficult to do something about temperature. But the other thing is discharge. Um, uh, okay, that's a little bit later. Let me go back to temperature for a second. So this is looking at temperature spatially. So these are winter water temperatures below the reservoir, and we're particularly interested in the area between the reservoir and the Yosemite boundary. And in the winter, that water gets cooler as we get further from the reservoir. It's, there's more cold air forcing, and the water gets colder. But close to the dam, it's quite warm. Um, during the summer, it's just the opposite. It's cool near the reservoir. It gets warmer as it goes downstream. And one interesting little sidebar is that um, this actually could be a future thermal refuge. So at some point, as the climate warms, when everything is very, very warm, this actually, these tailwaters will be cooler. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and then the algal growth parallels 
the winter water temperature in that there's a lot of algae near the dam and it gets less and less as we go downstream. Okay, now I get to talk about discharge. So much as with the substrate, the above habitat and the Merced habitat, which is really similar, same goes for flows. So on the y-axis, we've got flow um, in CFS, cubic feet per second, time across here. Uh, this is 2015, so again, we're back in the drought. And you can see this very distinctive spring flood pulse in both environments. Again, very similar. Okay, again, during the drought, let's see what it looks like below the dam. Almost flat because the city's having to sequester what little water is, is coming in. They need to, to keep it all. And this is, by the way, although there's a difference in height of the y-axis, the scale is the same. So, very different. And what you see in the middle there is not gonna be capable of scouring much algae. Now, 2016, we're still in the drought, but it's a little bit better. Um, again, the above and reference habitat in the Merced is quite similar. And the below habitat looks better, or the below flows look better now. We have this pulse right in the middle. And this is really key. But you can see it's not the same pulse, right? It looks different. It looks different because there's this one super strong element to it right in the middle. And then in addition to that, so that's there. And then the rising and falling limbs of the hydrograph are much steeper than you see here. So this is not a natural phenomenon. This is an effort to recreate as much of a natural flow pulse in the spring as we can. So this is the result of a collaboration between the National Park Service, the city of San Francisco, and academics such as Utah and myself, putting our heads together and seeing how any excess water can best be used ecologically. So the city's job one obviously is to deliver water to the Bay Area. That's why they're there, to deliver that water but they're going to have some excess water and they can just as easily do something good with it as nothing with it. And so by working with the city, we've been able to engineer these releases to as best as possible replicate a natural spring flood. Now, those three points that I pointed out deviate from what you see in natural spring flood pulses. It's too high in the middle, too sharp, and then the ramping on either end is very sharp too. There are reasons for that. And we'll come back to that in the third part of the talk. And then in 2017, finally, right, water after all the drought. And so at this point, we actually have higher flows at times below the dam than elsewhere. So now there's an excess of water, and it can actually be used to attempt to scour habitat out and improve ecological conditions below the reservoir. And that's what was done. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Bottom line is algal growth is much lower after the high 2017 flows. Uh, the setup for this graph is over here, we have basically the amount of algae, the weight of algae, if you would. 15, 16 before the, before the big floods, 17, 18 afterwards, after the engineered floods. And the orange is below habitat, the blue is above, and the green is reference. Hope that shows up as green. Um, and we'll see a few more graphs like this later, same kind of setup. So at this stage, you can see that the algae below the dam is about three times greater than that above the dam. Big difference. Um, after the flooding, there's still more below the dam, but there's about a three-fold reduction in the amount of algae. There's been a lot of scour, which is exactly what was hoped for. So a lot of algae has been moved out. And you can see that photographically. This goes back to our fall 2015 picture, which you've seen before. Let's fast forward then to after those engineered releases in fall of 2017. So much less algae. So that's great. <clears throat> okay, you've seen this image before too. That's below the dam, fall of 2015. And this next picture makes me very happy. That's below the dam in 2017. I mean, that really pretty darn good invertebrate habitat a huge amount of scour has taken place. A lot of algae has been displaced. So does that cascade into the invertebrate assemblage like we would hope? 
And the answer is it does in some complicated ways, I guess. Um, here the y-axis is the abundance, the, the number of aquatic insects in the river. <clears throat> and Amy has spent a lot of time picking those out of samples. Um, there's more below the dam than the other habitats. And then after those flows, after those strong flood pulses, there's less everywhere and only about half as many below the dam as there were before. And you'd think that was bad, but it's actually not bad because a disproportionate number of those animals that have been scoured away are these midges. And there were too darn many of those midges to begin with. But those EPT taxa, the ones that are more desirable, if you would, the mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, the proportion of those go up. So here, so this is the proportion of EPT, those critters we like, on the y-axis, a lot fewer below the dam. After those scouring events, even though there's been a net loss of total invertebrate number, the proportion of these critters we like have gone up by about 50% relative to before. So that's a positive development. And then perhaps most important of all, the number of tolerant fauna are, are reduced. So we think of tolerance as being a good thing, and of course it is, except in rivers. And tolerant fauna, what we call tolerant fauna in the ecological vernacular, are animals that can basically put up with non-ideal conditions. Could be polluted, there could be a lot of silt, there could be a lot of algae, um, and so they would tend to be outcompeted in many cases by other organisms, but they can tough it out in bad conditions. And this is measured here with the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index. And all that's important here is that higher numbers are not good, lower numbers are good. So before the releases, as you might expect, there's more tolerant critters above the, uh, below the dam. But then after the releases, they've gone down. Not by that much, but it's not necessarily a linear relationship. And here's where I get out my big grain of salt. And that's because thresholds, of course, are really important ecologically in all kinds of different systems. We all know this intuitively and from reading. Um, but in, in stream ecology, I think, in some ways in particular, um, at various times there's been an over-reliance on looking at certain numbers and is that number higher or lower than some level? And back in the 70s, there was kind of a bad period where if the diversity index was higher than this, it was a happy stream, and lower than that, it was an unhappy stream. And of course, as we all know, it's more complicated than that. There's a similar kind of line for tolerance and for this Hilsenhoff biotic index. Um, and so with the preface that uh, nature abhors a threshold and a box as much as it does a vacuum, right? With, with that preface, there's your line. And pre-flood, we were well above that non-ideal line. Post-flooding, post-engineered floods, we're a little bit below. So that's good. In reality, of course, it's probably more of a spectrum, more of a gradient. But it was an improvement. So some takeaways from this second section. So first of all, there's lots of algae below the dam, um, if not mitigated in some way. Um, and the fauna are negatively affected by having all those algae. Engineered spring floods can directly remove algal cover, directly remove the midges and black flies, and that's these critters here on your left, and then by doing those things, indirectly increase the EPT, the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies that we'd like to see um, have a greater proportion of the assemblage. And I really like this, an old, um, diagram by Robert Usinger from 1957, and uh, just shows the, the richness of fauna that is possible in a river. Lots of different sizes, particularly big animals, lots of predators, lots of different ways of making a living. And after those spring releases, it looks more like this and less like the image on the left. So, these engineered releases in the spring may give us a way of, of fighting the algae and, and maybe even winning. Okay, so the third part are wetlands and the effect on wetlands of these planned dam releases. So this is not looking downstream anymore, we're looking out of the stream in the surrounding upland habitat, if you would. 
So we want to see how these wetland fauna are affected by river regulation, if anything can be done about it, if, it, if they are affected. Um, this is the Pupano Valley in Yosemite. It's a funny name. Um, it's the world's steepest little trail down there. It's not very far. Um, but people call it the pooping out trail. Um, but this is, this is within a mile of a road in Yosemite National Park. And when you go there by trail, you hardly ever see anyone. Just amazing. It's a beautiful little place. Um, there's our river. River does run through it. And there's our wetland that straddles the river, both sides. And it's an amazing place. Um, there's this pond that formed or would have formed pre-river regulation every year when the banks overtopped with the river flow and that pond filled up. That has not happened reliably post-dam construction. There's incredible bird diversity in this area. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, each of the 18 or 19 species of bats in Yosemite National Park are found in this little valley. Not only there, but are represented there. And a lot of great work has been done by Breezy Jackson, Sarah Stock, and, and colleagues on this. And also the connection of these animals to the insect world that we study. Lots of insect diversity too. Um, these are just, uh, this is a tiny snapshot of all the invertebrate fauna that live in that area and other wetland habitat as well. So in this one photo, there are carrion feeders, nectar feeders, parasites, wood borers, herbivores, and multiple levels of carnivores. And that's more than the number of animals you see there. And the reason is that they do different things at different stages of their life cycle, which adds to the trophic complexity, the food web complexity. So there are two main types of wetlands uh, there in the valley. And one is wet meadow, where animals like this June beetle live. So this wet meadow habitat needs annual flooding. But it doesn't, stay, it doesn't stay wet and inundated for very long, maybe just a couple or three weeks. It stays saturated, so it needs that annual pulse of water and has not always gotten it. And then there's the pond, this marshy pond habitat. And as I mentioned, that has not always seen water either. And that's where you see things like this scary-looking, predaceous diving beetle, which um, can be about as big as your pinky. You could almost put them on the barbecue if you wanted. <laughs> And there's sort of a forlorn pond with no water in it. That's Utah on a very hot day, probably also forlorn. <laughs> uh, very hot and dry. Very still down there, too. Not much air movement. So that's, that's the way it has looked in years without engineering water releases into this area. So could wetland diversity and abundance be increased if we can restore natural flooding? So there's the full pond on your right. And this is what it looks like during a flooding event, a still from up above. Water everywhere, right? This is a happy, happy wetland. And uh, this is what it would have looked like almost every year pre-dam construction, which in turn looks kind of a lot like Hetch Hetchy Valley with all this water spilling out into the wetlands neighboring the river. So I'm gonna show you about a 30 or 45 second video um, of the flooding event. And what you'll see here is, first of all, uh, the river is in here. You can see it a little bit there. It'll start to rise. It'll overtop this sandbar. And you'll see some water starting to flow out here into this wet meadow habitat next. And then through a little back channel, really quickly, you'll see this pond flood all at once. Also, there were a lot of clouds coming over and uh, even some sprinkles on this day. So there's a little bit of a strobe effect, so I hope that's not too hard on your eyes. This is courtesy of Bill Sears. So off we go. Let's see some wetland flooding. So you start to see a little bit of flooding over here. River's coming up. Sandbar is flooded. All of a sudden, there it is. Woohoo! That. 
That is a wetland breathing a sigh of relief. That's about a 14-hour uh, time period. So that's what it looks like in that wetland. Um, let's go on a little river rafting trip. So this is taking a look at what the river looks like during those these engineered floods. So here we're at about 200 CFS, which during the drought would have been more probably than the river would have seen. It might have been that much, but um, fairly low flows. So now we're going to almost double it to 400 CFS, but we have a ways to go. Now we're going to increase it by almost a factor of 10 to almost 4,000 CFS. And here we are at 6,250 CFS. I wouldn't want to be in a kayak. Um, so it's rocking and rolling. And just by point of reference, here's a picture during the flooding event and at 200 CFS from the same vantage point, that's the same uh, branch. Big difference. And it's not just in the river. Look at the neighboring upland habitat here. Major scour. So a lot of stuff is getting scoured out and a lot of things are happening here. So you have terrestrial nutrients entering the aquatic ecosystem and aquatic nutrients entering the terrestrial ecosystem. So there's a lot of exchange at that point too. So to see what was going on with all this, um, and for other projects, we sampled. We used two main techniques. There's a sweep net. It looks like Utah's out there kind of daintily chasing butterflies. Um, but she's not. This is actually systematic sampling, working our way through that tall vegetation. Um, so there's that. And then we use this thing called a throw trap, uh, which is just an aluminum box without a top or bottom. We built this thing. Um, so you throw it, um, hopefully with a good wind at your back, and uh, it lands in the water, and you scoop everything out. And this thing is not fun to lug up and down the pooping out trail. It's like we can't figure out which way to go there. <laughs> you go first, no you. <laughs> okay, so just a couple of graphics here <clears throat> showing the importance of wetland flooding. Um, so first of all, up here in, the, in your upper right, looking at some small snowmelt ponds. And those are going to form whether or not there's overtopping of the bank and flooding of the big pond. So those are always there. You can see the little one meter bar there for scale. They don't last um, quite as long. Um, and I'll show you some stuff about what they, they can produce. And then there's the big seasonal pond. So here we're looking at aquatic animals that live in ponds and puddles and so forth here on the, the y-axis. And early and late season, that's not so important. But the, the key thing here are the small bars, which are solid, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the small ponds, snowmelt ponds, they're solid, and the large pond that needs flooding to fill, uh, that's clear. So if there's not flooding, if there's not an, an effort to get an engineered spring release, all we have are those small ponds, and this is the aquatic invertebrate abundance that you get. When it's flooded, you get this. So a huge increase. But in times when there was not an effort to engineer those releases, or at times when you're dealing with a drought year like this in 2015, you wouldn't have gotten that production out of the big pond. We only would have had this. So not very much. And then the other graph to show you is, here we're looking at the aquatic-derived fauna and other wetland habitat after releases. And I like this photo. This is a little damselfly, pretending that we can't see it, right? <laughs> you can't see me. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're looking at animals like that, that make their living as juveniles in the water, but then as adults, they fly around on land and do things like catch mosquitoes that are, that are useful to do. So here we're looking at the number of aquatic-derived animals that Utah's catching with her, her sweep net there. And um, these different categories aren't so important, but the key thing here is this is with no release, and on the right hand of the x-axis, this is with release. Not so many animals without a dam release. And then afterwards, a lot more. So it's more productive in that way too. So that was good. And here I'm just showing you, this is not exactly like any engineered release, but it's pretty darn close if you think back to some of the other images. So here we're looking at flow below Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, and then a timeline here in the spring when we have naturally occurring high flows, like right now. Um, 
So <clears throat> there are a lot of demands for this, even ecologically, even among all of us on conference calls and in a, in a conference room talking about how best to use this water, there are a lot of competing needs. And it often ends up something like this, where we get some initial flooding and then sort of a plateau. There's a reason for that. Steep pulse here, because we have to, this takes a lot of water, and that's to flood the pond. Big pulse to flood the pond, but that's a lot of water, which means we don't get to ramp that up slowly and ramp it down slowly and then trying for as slow a recession as we can manage. And so there, there are negative and positive things that happen during this. So to take you through a few of those, this is actually something we haven't talked about yet, which is frog breeding habitat. So frogs like <coughs> puddly areas on the sides of river, riverine habitat. But if you bring the water up too quickly, those newly deposited eggs get washed out. So that's why there's a bit of a plateau there. And then this ramps up and we start to get some good stuff like scouring out that algae and once again, pre and post flood algal samples. We lose midges, we call drift losses. So when there's a lot of scour and when other things can happen too, animals can leave the substrate, the rocks they live on in the bottom of the river. They can be physically yanked off the rocks, you know, and go for a ride, or they can say, oh, this is scary around here, I'm out of here, and they sort of bail actively into the water column. So midges are lost, and that's actually a good thing, we want fewer midges. And there are also some negative effects, that's why this is in red versus green, there are also EPT drift losses, which we'd rather not have, but that's collateral damage. Um, the pond fills, which was key, um, this is a bad one. It doesn't usually happen because there are a lot of smart bird people working on this. But if there's a mismatch, so if the birds show up at the wrong time during this, if flooding is higher, if they nest a little bit lower, there can be some birds' nests flooded out. And that usually doesn't happen. Um, gravel can be mobilized, which is kind of both good and bad. Um, then as, as the water recedes, you can lose more EPT to drift because animals also will actively drift if they sense flows going down. Um, as, the flows as, the, as the pond fills and as animals colonize, we start to get lots of pond invertebrates like we talked about. The stream invertebrates um, have less stranding loss on this shallower recession limb. We start to get more terrestrial invertebrates, birds and bats and we have an increase in EPT and a decrease in tolerance in the stream. So you can see there's, there's a, this is a really complicated system and everybody's trying to do the most good they can with X amount of water. And it's not perfect, um, it's still being refined. Um, so here's, here's some takeaways for this part and really the whole talk. So number one, so a number of factors have resulted in affecting river and wetland habitats below the dam as you've seen. But those effects that are created by the dam can also be lessened by using the engineering capabilities of the dam. Um, so we can create pond habitat and produce abundant pond fauna. You can increase the number of aquatic derived insects and increase vertebrate abundance by engineering these floods. And you can reduce river algae and increase EPT. Those are all good things. But um, again, lots of ecological and physical engineering to be done. Um, we are still putting this picture together. And who knows where we will end up. <laughs> this is the inverted, this is a real thing, it's not Photoshop. This is the inverted fountain down at, at campus at UCLA. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. But what isn't awesome is we haven't gotten around to sampling it yet, <laughs> which we need to do. So I thank you for your careful attention. <laughs> to uh, get a drink of water. I just wanted to make um, a couple of quick announcements before the questions while you're all here. Is that okay? Um, first of all, because this is our last seminar of this series, um, I just really wanted to thank all of you guys that have been coming every week. Um, 
We are so fortunate to be in a community like this with um, people like you all that are interested in science and uh, part of this community, so thanks to you. Um, I also wanted to thank um, the staff here, uh, Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserves and Snarl, um, really who have helped to make this seminar series happen. Um, in the back uh, is our Assistant Reserve Director, Chris Orr. Chris, you wanna wave your hand? Um, We're looking for Annie, Annie Barrett Kashner. Um, Annie really is the person who has coordinated the seminar series. Um, most of you guys know Annie, but if you don't, I just want to have Annie wave. Also, super talented, as you've seen tonight. Uh, and then Ben Peck, right next to Annie there. Ben is our steward and uh, helps with everything. And then, of course, my family, Steve and Nico, they get drafted into everything around here, so we couldn't do it without them. Um, and then in particular, um, we have a huge crew of volunteers that come every week, and they help with everything from parking to T-shirts to just whatever it is. So thanks to you guys, volunteers. Just you guys are awesome. Um, and then one volunteer in particular who really makes everything happen here technically Paul Page, Paul. Um, thanks to Paul, all this stuff works seamlessly. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention too is if you've missed seminars, most of the time we record them. We've had a few technical difficulties um, this season, but if you're looking for the place for that, it's on our website. We have a YouTube channel, so Jeff, your, your seminar tonight was recorded. Um, others have been recorded. You can find those and go back and look at those later. Um, if you'd like to be added to our email list, you can also subscribe on our website and find that. Um, and then finally, I had one more thing that I cannot think of. Oh, I will be sending, um, if you are on our email list, um, a little survey in the next couple weeks. We're always looking for um, ideas that you guys might have for what would be a great topic for a seminar or a person that you might know of that would like to come here and speak. Um, we, in the last couple of years, as you've seen, have tried to sort of mix it up. We get people that are local, we get some people from afar, um, and just wanted to get your feedback on all that. So um, look, look for that, and uh, happy to have you guys contribute. Yes, Chris? Oh, and of course, if, um, if you'd like to come out to Valentine this summer, we have a schedule of public tours. It's on our website as well. I think there's maybe a flyer or two in the back you can grab. We have tours on um, geology, history, um, bears, all kinds of stuff at Valentine. It's going to be a fantastic summer to be out at Valentine with all the snow and all the water we've gotten. The wildflowers are going to be incredible um, as usual. So please come out to those. Tell your friends if they're interested. Anything else I'm forgetting, Annie? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's been really, really awesome this season. I think this is the biggest crowds we've ever had um, so far. So uh, it's great. Yeah, Chris. What is Valentine? What is Valentine? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> I have to let Jeff answer questions. So Valentine uh, Camp is our other reserve. Most of you know where that is in town, up Old Mammoth Road. Um, again, it's a 150-acre site. It's part of the natural reserve system. So we manage both Snarl and Valentine Camp jointly here. So that's the, the other reserve. And uh, it's a fantastic place to get out to, especially in the summertime. It's going to be beautiful this year. So. Jeff, I would like you now to take over and answer questions on that on the talk. Well, mic up again. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I guess you provide much of the water for San Francisco. When you mentioned in the pipeline, where does the pipeline start? Uh, was the stream flow below the dam, the whole flow of the Tuolumne, or where's that pipeline kept in the water to take to San Francisco? 
Right. It's it is a complicated system and I can't give you any kind of complete answer, but there are there are they are drawing water from Eleanor and Cherry Lakes um, that are perched up above Hetch Hetchy. There's a bypass around some of the river uh, that is piped out directly from the reservoir. And then there are also subsidiary reservoirs downstream that carry it. Um, but the piping is there on and off from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that depends, in, indeed. That depends on the year and how saturated the soils were to begin with. But typically, if there is typical, I would say three months. Because even under those situations, it's never year-round. It's always a perennial pond. Yeah. So Carolyn. Like Now, as far as I know, nobody's done any formal mathematical modeling of that. That's probably above our collective academic horsepower. Um, but no, it, there's just so many variables, including non-ecological variables. Um, they, they have to worry about people downstream. They have to worry about rafters, fisher folk, et cetera. So it may not even be something that could be modeled well. Um, but it has changed some, uh, somewhat every year. Uh, as I mentioned, that was sort of a representative release, but they actually started about 10 years ago, and when there's been enough water, they've been done. Yeah. Yes? Well, that was fairly typical, um, absent those super big pulses of 2017. Um, I think it did worsen during the drought. Um, so, yeah, it got worse during that time. But it was more typical than not for our first 11 years on the project. Yeah. Yes? Right. Um, it's certainly a possibility. A lot of people have worked hard to make that happen. Um, there was a referendum, and some of you folks know more about this than I do, I think in 2014, um, and that failed. There was also uh, some changes made such that all of the 29 affected municipalities would have to approve it, so that's sort of an additional roadblock. Um, would it change things? Yes, it would change things quite a bit, um, and there have been prognostications of how long it would take for the valley to come back. Um, and it's both surprising how little time is required and how much time would be required. Um, so you'd have something like a functioning valley floor probably in 20 years, uh, you'd have good stands of conifers and deciduous trees developing probably in 40 years. And the interesting thing is the last thing to come back are the lichens. There's that bathtub ring where if you think back some of those, those photos I showed you, there's this white band just above the water level. And above that, it's kind of that brown lichen color that we all know and love from Yosemite Valley. They would actually take longer to come back than the trees, probably about 80 years for them. Yeah. Yes. No, no. Others have been done like this, um, and famously on the Colorado River, there were a number of studies that were done there that led to a variety of flushing flows. There, the emphasis was on scouring sediment out more than algae. So there have been some regulated river systems where nothing like this has been done, some where a lot has been done, and others in between. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It, yeah, it is, it is a pulse. Um, I don't think that it is in such large amounts that would cause anoxia. Um, so there are some, some lentic systems, some areas of still water, very different environments, where if there's a sudden pulse of algae, the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen, just plummets. But this is a small enough amount in a highly oxygenated river that, yeah, really not a problem. No. No, it's dying. Yep. Bruce. Waves, 
Right. And, and yes is the answer. There are strata. And as you may know, it changes through the year. So it's not like the top is always coldest or always warmest. And there's, there can be shifting, vertical shifting of these layers of cold or warm water. And so I've talked to the people from the city of San Francisco because they have valves at different levels. So if we could get in there, as you're implying, and figure out where the cold and warm water is, if we want colder water out during the winter, could we hit the right valve, hit the button, release from there if they're going to be releasing somewhere? Um, and their answer was, well, theoretically, maybe, but the problem is, you know, infrastructure has been in our news lately, right? The infrastructure is so old and creaky, they're worried that if they messed with some of these valves, they might not be able to get them back where they are. So when, when I alluded to, yeah, maybe you could fix temperature or tinker with temperature, maybe, maybe, um, or develop some very large siphon type apparatus. And we did something on a very small scale like that actually in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yes. Right. Just so. So um, below the dam, we're going from base levels that are extremely low up to fairly high levels. But in the unregulated parts of the rivers, too, it's a natural phenomenon. So whereas the flows might be increasing by a factor of 40 below the dam, they're still increasing by a factor of 5 or 10 above the dam, and that can be enough to get the, the algae moving. So it happens naturally as well, but just to a lesser extent. Yes? Oh, invasive plants? Yeah, there are. Um, there have been a couple of outcrops of, a, um, of an invasive aquatic species. Uh, people lovingly call it rock snot. And, um, <laughs> and it hasn't really gotten much of a hold. Uh, we saw a few little pockets of it actually before those big releases. And one of the many happy things about the releases were that those were scoured out. And we haven't seen them since then. Would they come back? I don't know. But yeah, definitely a threat. Yes. Correct. Right, with all that granite. And with uh, the algae, it's, it's plant, it relies on nutrients like nitrates and phosphorus. What's driving that? Where is that nutrient coming from? Right. They're pretty nutrient efficient. And um, one thing that I thought we would see based on some of our numbers. I thought that we would see more nutrients even above the reservoir on the Tuolumne than we saw in the Merced. And there hasn't been a lot of nutrient sampling, but the little bit that has been done by the park suggests that it's actually really low nutrient concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus in all those river reaches, below, above, and on the Merced. Yeah, but the point you raise in addition to um, most of the snowmelt going into the river, there's another interesting facet as well, and that's the amount of sedimentation in the reservoir, because sedimentation is the enemy of a reservoir. So I alluded several times to you and me working in the tropics, and we were working there on some, there, Puerto Rico is heavily dammed. The Army Corps of Engineers has been very active there. And there are dams that are only functional for maybe 40 or 50 years, because they literally fill with sediment, and then there's sheet flow right across the top. It's like flowing across a mud flat, and that used to be a reservoir. The incredible thing is, and the reason why San Francisco doesn't have to filter the water, they, they purify it with chlorine, but they don't have to filter it, is that this water is so non-turbid. It's so crystal clear. Um, and amazingly, in almost 200, 100 years of operation, there's been two inches of sediment accumulation on the bottom of the reservoir. It's just staggering. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would add to that uh, mammoth water supply is similar catchment. And by regulation, we actually have to add turbidity to the water to get the removal rates required. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is something. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do we have a microphone? You're on stage now. So the, the mammoth water supply uh, comes from the Lake Mary Basin into Lake Mary, and it's virtually all snow melt. And it's so uh, pure in terms of turbidity, meaning particles in it, 
that to meet the regulations, we actually have to add an inert material to remove it to get the required removal rate. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, granite. Yes, that's right. So it's it's not like dealing with um, oh I don't know say some of the tuff that we have down in Swall where where Utah and I live. Um, yeah, it's just it's just so hard to erode that there's very little transport down into the reservoir, at least for Hetch Hetchy. Yeah. Yeah, Ed. Right. Uh, the other question is, they wanted to take the dam out, but I never got clarity during the debate five or six years ago. Is there an alternate dam site downstream that could replace the Texas function for San Francisco and still free up the valley, or is that an alternative that's not even been looked at? No, it's, it's been examined pretty carefully. Um, and so there are multiple answers to that question. So they, they can, in fact, come up with that amount of water elsewhere. Um, they cannot come up with that amount of uber clean water that does not require a filtration plant. So there's that. But they can acquire the water elsewhere. It's not dirty water, but it's just a little bit more turbid that requires filtration. The other thing, too, is because they're very complicated mechanisms by which the city works with manip municipalities and they're buying water from this entity and selling it to that entity, that becomes a problem. Um, what they can't really replace ultimately is hydropower, which we think of really as being secondary to the reservoir function of that water. And there'd be about 5% of the city's power that would have to come, be come by some other way by conservation or what have you. Um, and that's estimated to be about a $2 billion loss over about 50 years. So that's actually in some ways harder to come up with than the water. The water can be acquired. And apparently it's right. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is anything done to the water in the dam? Oh, while it's sitting, while, while it's passing through the dam or in residency? The question was, is anything done to the water at the dam? And no, as far as I know, nothing at all. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you folks very much.